Good morning. My name is Dr. David Tamasia. I'm the Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences and an, and an Associate Professor of Theology here at the University of Mary. On behalf of Dr. Scott Cleveland, our Director of Catholic Studies who cannot make it today, I welcome you to our sixth annual St. Hildegard Lecture. The St. Hildegard Lecture is an annual tradition in Catholic Studies in which we bring significant Catholics to campus to reflect on the importance of some of the main themes of our Catholic Studies program. The relationship of faith and reason, the role of beauty and art in culture, and our mission to transform the world from within. This lecture is named for St. Hildegard of Bingen, an 11th century Benedictine abbess who was a mystic, an expert in medicine, a poet, a musician, and a canonized saint and doctor of the church. St. Hildegard represents the best of the integration that we seek in our Catholic Studies program here at the University of Mary. Before I introduce our lecturer for, for today, I first want to introduce the president of the University of Mary and invite him to welcome you. Monsignor James Patrick Shea was ordained a priest in 2002 and became president of the University of Mary in 2009. In 2010, he inspired and oversaw the formation of the Catholic Studies program here at the University of Mary. Monsignor Shea has studied widely in multiple disciplines and at multiple institutions and is committed to integrating within, within himself, as well as you students, the vision of the whole person formation we seek to do in Catholic Studies. Monsignor Shea has served as an inspirational teacher and mentor for many, many students. With his integrated vision of Catholic education, Monsignor Shea has led the University of Mary to tremendous growth in students, programs, facilities, faculty, staff, and much more. Please join me in welcoming Monsignor Shea to the podium. Why don't we begin with a prayer? We'll pray using the words of St. John Henry Newman, one of the patron saints of the Catholic Studies program. This is a prayer for the light of truth. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O oh my God, I confess that you alone can enlighten my darkness. I confess that you alone can. I wish my darkness to be enlightened. I do not know whether you will, but that you can and that I wish are sufficient reasons for me to ask what you at least have not forbidden my asking. I hereby promise that by your grace, which I am asking, I will embrace whatever I at length feel certain is the truth, if ever I come to be certain. And by your grace, I will guard against all self-deceit which may lead me to take what nature would have rather than what reason approves. Amen. It's my honor and joy to welcome all of you to the annual St. Hildegard Lecture. I want to offer warm thanks and gratitude to Dr. Scott Cleveland and to all of the faculty member, members and fellows of our Catholic Studies program, of which I'm so proud. Dr. Thomasia, when you were talking about the establishment of Catholic Studies here at the University of Mary, Diane Flaidlin is here. She's in the front row. Uh, remember, Diane, when uh, it was in the course of the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the university, so November of 2009, uh, the sisters gifted the Gift Hill Cross back to the university, and then you and I got in my little GMC envoy with the license plates that said, Go to Mass. And we drove down to the University of St. Thomas to spy on the things that they were doing in Catholic Studies, where we were warmly received by Dr. Don Briel. Don Briel um, was the founder of Catholic Studies at the University of St. Thomas, which he had established 
and led for nearly 20 years before leaving St. Thomas and coming here to the University of Mary where he spent his final years as a scholar and mentor um, as the blessed John Henry Newman Chair of Liberal Arts at the University. Don would have turned 75 years old this past Friday. He was born on the Feast of St. Thomas Aquinas, the patron saint of students and universities. So this would have been his 75th birthday last Friday. Four years ago, he lay dying of double leukemia. And uh, our speaker today is a significant Catholic. What a happy phrase that we bring here for the St. Hildegard Lectures, significant Catholics. We truly have a significant Catholic here today. <laughs> he was also a friend of Don Brio. And I remember uh, meeting you, Jay, uh, not for the first time, thankfully, but meeting you there in Minneapolis. It was after a great big Minnesota snowstorm. And we visited Don and then went to a pub called Merlin's Rest and cried a little bit at the impending death of our friend. Jay, uh, who is our lecturer today, was a friend of Don. He has the spirit of Catholic studies. I'm eager for you to hear his lecture and his thoughts today, which will be so pulsating with the vision that we hold dear here at the University of Mary. Uh, Dr. Reyes is on our board of trustees here at the University of Mary, where he serves with distinction. I also serve with him on the board of the Fellowship of Catholic University Students. Um, and he's involved in all kinds of different ways. When I think about Jay, I think about one time when he called me on the phone. Uh, it was, I think, in the final stages of the last editing of the manuscript for From Christendom to Apostolic Mission. And Dr. Reyes wanted to express some very specific and good concerns about the tone of one or two sections. And we talked about that for a long time. And I've reflected on that conversation since because I think that Dr. Reyes, in everything that he's done, as long as I've known him, has been a master of tone, not just in the manuscript of a book here or there, how things should be said or done, uh, but in his leadership at Catholic Charities in Denver, in Focus and the Augustan Institute, uh, in his work at the Office of Peace, Justice and Human Development at the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, now in his service to the Knights of Columbus and everything that Jay does, he is not just a significant Catholic, but he is a quintessential joyful Christian man. Uh, and the world needs witnesses of that kind. People who bring to everything, to every battle, to every struggle, to every project, a winsome, joyful, conquering spirit, which is truly the spirit of Christ. My friend, uh, Dr. J. Reyes, brings that in everything he does. And you'll witness it here in just a few minutes, just you see. And so I'm just happy to welcome him, but also to welcome all of you to this annual St. Hildegard Lecture. God bless you all. Dr. Jonathan Reyes serves currently as the Senior Vice President of Communications and Strategic Partnerships for the Knights of Columbus. Dr. Reyes studied European history as a Rackham Fellow at the University of Michigan and earned a PhD in European history from the University of Notre Dame, focusing on the historical vision of Christopher Dawson. Dr. Reyes has previously served as Assistant General Secretary for Integral Human Development and is the Executive Director of the, De the Department of Justice, Peace, and Human Development for the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. As President and CEO of Catholic Charities in the Archdiocese of Denver, and as Vice President for Ministry and Formation for the Fellowship of Catholic University Students, or FOCUS, Dr. Reyes helped to co-found the Augustan Institute in Denver and served as its very first president. Prior to that, 
Dr. Reyes taught history at Christendom College, where he, is also ser where he also served as Vice president, president for Academic Affairs. Dr. Reyes serves on the governing boards of FOCUS and the University of Mary, and has been instrumental in supporting quality education at the University of Mary. As a sign of our Benedictine hospitality, please stay through the end of the lecture. If you end up a few minutes late to your next class students, you can tell your teachers that you have a permission slip to do so from the university's president. <laughs> Dr. Reyes has a lecture for us today that will get to the heart of a significant obstacle for Catholic education and for the new evangelization. The title of his talk is Making the Gospel Real in a Gnostic World. Please join me in offering a warm welcome to Dr. Jonathan Reyes. Good morning. Thanks, thanks for y'all being here. When I came in here to start and I saw these empty chairs, I thought, I'm doomed. Uh, despite the kind introduction and the insistence that you're a significant Catholic. By the way, when someone says that about you six times, it probably means you're not that significant and they're trying to sell you on it. So you came anyway. Thank you very much for coming. I won't ask how many of you were required to come. I'll just assume that you did this voluntarily because uh, you didn't want to enjoy the nice weather. And uh, Monsignor, great to see you, Reverend Fathers. Uh, dear sisters, a model of Benedictine hospitality. You made it 40 degrees in January when I came. That's, that's remarkable. That's going over the top. Uh, faculty, administrators, and students. Um, what I'd like to do today uh, in the talk is talk about evangelization and education in the context of what I believe are, what I'm calling ideological religious viewpoints and a couple dominant ideological religious viewpoints out there. I want to get after this. So I've been in DC now for about 10 years uh, doing various things. So I'm in the middle of these kinds of debates all the time. I work with all kinds of people with pretty strong ideological commitments from all over. And part of the mystery, part of the challenge, part of the thing you're trying to understand is what makes these things tick? And how do we bring the gospel to bear at this moment? So that's the question. And I'm going to sort of locate it here at the university, in, at the university in general, uh, as a place in which a preparation of mind and heart for a certain kind of evangelistic work is done. Now, it was kind of you to be told that you could stay late, but I was told very clearly I got 40 minutes, period. I timed this this morning. It was 39 and 32 seconds. So I'm going to just jump right in. Let me begin with an obvious statement. And this is the thing, this is the problem with talking to a place like you, Mary. A lot of this you already know, but pretend it's insightful. So let me start with the obvious. Evangelization is the church's most urgent task today. This is one sense always true. This is what the church does. But there's a particular urgency. We see it because of the decline in church participation in the West and the related rise of unchurched generations, it's somewhat unprecedented. Some people call it a mass apostasy. That might be too strong. In addition, we see people leaving the church. We see a large number of those still in church who no longer believe the key tenets of the faith. We're seeing not just the denial of controversial sexual issues, which everybody knows are the hot button issues, but also the denial of central theological dogmas, such as the divinity of Christ in the real presence. And despite the temporary slowing of this decline resulting from the immigration of Catholics to the US, it's well documented that these populations also are leaving the faith in the second and third generations. It's one of the things we studied at the USCCB and other places. There's a sense that something has to be done rather quickly to reverse these trends. Contributing to this, of course, is the secularization of Western culture. What for a time was a kind of dismissal of the faith with a push for sort of a tolerated but privatized Christianity is increasingly turning into genuine hostility to Christian belief particularly as regards those ideas which run on against the sexual revolution. And this intolerance is emanating from our most important cultural forming institutions, from colleges and universities, government, global corporations, the press, and the media industry. Now, none of this is meant to be alarmist. There are different seasons in the warfare that Christ is waging for the souls of men and women. And in every moment, the gospel advances according to his plan. 
So we don't evangelize out of panic as though this is some kind of frenzied last ditch effort, effort to save the church. After all, while it's impossible to predict what the church in the world will look like in our own lifetime, we know demography, demography isn't necessarily destiny. In fact, as the historian Christopher Dawson put it, quote, the great cultural changes and the historic revolutions that decide the fate of nations or the character of an age are the cumulative result of a number of spiritual decisions. That's a beautiful line. A cumulative result of a number of spiritual decisions, the faith and insight or the refusal and blindness of individuals. So we take stock of our situation the moment the Lord's given us. We look to see how Christ is moving the gospel forward now. We commit to do our part and we trust that the Lord will use our efforts for his great purpose. We also pay attention to the context in which we are, where we are, not just what time we're in. And here we might say something about the importance of Catholic universities and colleges for the task of evangelization. There's an obvious point, the next generation of Catholic leaders are gonna come from places like this, so it matters how they're formed and trained. At a deeper level, however, evangelization in the West has always been a part of education, including higher education. This isn't necessarily obvious to us. Christopher Dawson argued this in 1949, quote, from the beginning, Christian education was conceived not so much as learning a lesson, but as an introduction into a new life or still more an initiation into a mystery. Christian education, he continued, was not only an initiation into the Christian community, it was also an initiation into another world. The unveiling of spiritual realities of which the natural man was unaware and which changed the meaning of existence, end quote. This is actually a pretty excellent sort of summary of what evangelization is about the unveiling of mysteries that change the meaning of existence. Now, the university does more than this, of course, but evangelization is a major component in any genuine Catholic educational enterprise. Wherever we are touching the truths of God, there is the impetus to step into those truths, to take them not simply as propositions, but to come to believe them. This is the conversion of the mind that St. Paul calls for. It involves an education that treats the faith not simply as an interesting subject matter for study, like the Constitution or the Civil War, but as a concrete truth and a living person. There's a lot of reasons why we've lost this sense, but the argument is we need to recover it. So we've seen many cases in which what's arisen in certain Catholic universities and colleges is a model of education that relegates the living concrete, concrete reality of faith to something like campus ministry, as a kind of voluntary extra that might just as well exist outside of the institution itself, and then we go ahead and make sure that the sacraments are available. So kick the faith over there to campus ministry, it's not really engaged in the intellectual project, and as long as the sacraments are around, we're in a good shape. This is problematic, it's not sufficient for the intellectual integration of the faith. Now let me just stay now to those who might be nervous about, there's probably no one in this room, but the corrective is not to then insist that we have to talk about Jesus 10 times in every class, or to turn our teaching into preaching, or to only teach theology and spirituality or something. That's not, that's a false corrective. The question is how do we get the educational project itself, which I take is to be the great sort of insight Don had into Catholic studies, and have it grab the faith in the disciplines in a way that protects the integrity of the disciplines protects the integrity of the faith, and creates a philosophical habit of mind, to use Newman. So this is the task of the university, and it makes it very important for the question of evangelization. There's another reason the university is particularly important for evangelization. I'm just gonna steal from Alistair McIntyre here. It stems from the fact that universities and colleges are among the primary places where the battle between Christian and non-Christian visions of the world are fought out. It is here that the contest between the Christian faith and the non-Christian ideologies of the day, which often function as rival religions, are engaged. A proper reckoning with the secular religions of the day requires sustained intellectual work that universities almost alone among Catholic institutions have the time and the skill to tackle. And this engagement, I must emphasize, is more than an apologetic task. Apologetics is important, but a genuine reckoning 
with modern ideology requires developing positive ways of presenting the gospel that take into account the needs and aspirations that otherwise drive these other ideologies. We need to know what they're going after. It's not enough to say that there are certain problems with them. We actually have to propose an answer to those problems, a better account. This is the great task. And this rearticulation of the gospel in the face of counter-religions has a powerful effect in shaping Catholic culture now. I'm just going to steal a lengthy quote from Alistair McIntyre. Bear with me. It's from a, a, a great lecture he gave called Catholic Instead of What? So, McIntyre, quote, Catholic Christians believe that God exists, that the word was made flesh, that the bread and wine of the Eucharist become Christ's body and blood, that the Pope and the bishops teach with apostolic authority. But Catholic Christians also disbelieve. And in each particular time and place, they deny just those secular doctrines, theories, and attitudes that then and there are taken to provide grounds for rejecting the truths of the Catholic faith. To be a reflective Catholic is always to be a Catholic rather than something else. So Augustine was a Catholic rather than a Manichaean or a Neoplatonist. Pascal was a Catholic rather than a skeptic or a Cartesian. Maritain was a Catholic rather than a materialist or a Bergsonian. Since the alternative and rival forms of belief with, each, with which Catholics need to engage vary from age to age, it follows that the beliefs of reflective Catholics also vary. Catholic culture that emerges from the quarrel with one such set of alternatives and rival forms of belief may be very different from that which emerges in other contexts. There have been and are Catholic cultures, not Catholic culture." End quote. The Catholic University then can provide the kind of deep and thoughtful disagreement with modern ideological religions from which will arise not just good critiques of those ideologies, but also positive articulations of the faith. These will be philosophical, poetic, narrative, works of visual art and music. They'll affect the practical sciences. And when these cultural creations are integrated with concrete communal forms and practices of the faith, a new Catholic culture will arise one that is suited for the times in which we live. A university is meant to be more than a group of similarly aged individuals who happen to share living quarters and like to hang out on the weekends and attend a variety of often unrelated classes during the weekdays. A Catholic university, under the leadership of its professors and administrators, is meant to provide an integrated life for students, one in which intellectual formation and the moral formation and the rhythm of the day and the social and religious practices of the community support and sustain one another in a way of life. Before turning to a brief description of the two ideological religions of the day, so what I want to do is I want to talk about, so what are these ideological religions? I'm going to look at two of them that kind of grab the current climate. Then I'm going to offer five ideas for how we do evangelism. So those are the last two parts. So if at a certain point you're despairing, will he ever finish? You know where I'm at in the talk. So before actually trying to, in brief, describe these ideological visions, let me take two insights that I think will set the stage for this, one from Christopher Dawson and one from Newman. Christopher Dawson is perhaps best known for his insistence, evidenced by his historical studies, that the root of every culture is a cult or a religion. That for culture to exist, the people need to agree on a fundamental picture of the world, which always tells a story and that answers the most important questions of life. What is good? What is evil? What is life for? What is death? Where am I going? And the story of the last 200 years, he believed, was the story of the West losing its cult, its religion, of Europe denying its Christian roots. The choice, he went on, was for the West to either recover its Christian roots or to await the new religious vision that would become the heart of a new culture. What was not an option in his mind was a culture without an organizing vision of reality. And I think we're seeing that in a poignant way today in the States. It should not surprise us then that as the process of de-Christianization has progressed, alternative religious visions have competed to provide the organizing principle of a new culture, from the positivist dreams of the 19th century to the horrors of the totalitarian experiments in the 20th, to the overconfidence in the victory of capitalism and liberalism at the, quote, end of history, end quote. But what has been unique about each of these alternatives and continues to characterize the two main ideological religions I'll discuss is that for the first time in human history, the alternative religions were and are explicitly non-transcendent. They deny as a first principle 
the existence of non-material reality in any meaningful way. This leads to my second observation, which I take from Newman, about the importance of first principles. In an 1865 letter, Newman wrote, quote, an evil time is before us. Principles are being adopted as starting points, which contradict what we know to be axioms. He further observed that the proponents of radically atheistic visions of the world, quote, ignore religious first principles, but assume first principles of their own without any compunction. The result of their dogmatism is that there is a general antecedent leading to the side of unbelief as the more reasonable and probable, end quote. So to understand the religions of the day and to engage them in a meaningful way requires getting to the level of first principles. And here's the problem, I think, with a lot of our public discussion right now. We don't get to first principles. We're talking about conclusions drawn from first principles. So DC, DC is an ongoing conversation about policy issues that are rooted in first principles. And so you're just talking past each other all the time. And so we got to dig. And we got to get down to starting points or there's really no way forward. That's why you get reactions like, can you believe those crazy people? They believe that. And can you believe those crazy people and they believe that? When in fact, if you get to first principles, things begin to make a little more sense. You may not disagree, but you get to know where the problem is. So I want to do first, let me just lay out for you things you already know about Catholic first principles and the story it tells, and then we'll look at these two ideological religions. So what's the story Catholics tell? Well, it, first of all, it takes as true that humans are creatures made by God in a particular way in his image and likeness with a destiny and a nature, that they were made out of love and therefore for communion with God and one another, that the law of good and evil are inscribed in their nature and made explicit by God, that revelation is not only possible but real, and that it tells us things about reality we could not discover by reason alone. Nonetheless, reason and faith work together, that there was a fall, a prideful rebellion of angels followed by that of humanity, and that from it, death and sin entered the world and the human race has since lived under the curse of its own rebellion. That this fall explains the suffering and injustice and alienation that we all see and experience in different ways. That the fall severely wounded human beings but did not eradicate within them the desire for an eternal life. That human beings were unable by themselves to fix this situation and that God had to intervene to redeem the human race. That human beings, though still wounded by the fall, which has also wounded our social relations, have by grace the ability to accept this act of redemption and once again fulfill our destiny to live forever in union with the loving creator. So this is the Christian account. What then are the other explanations for human life out there and what do they promise? Okay, so there's no perfect way to label these two things. And I'm actually gonna use somewhat awkward labels because I'm trying very hard to avoid, avoid language that would deliberately condemn them or praise them, okay? So, Forgive these, this poor nomenclature. Uh, one of them I'm just going to call the techno-naturalist vision, techno-naturalist. And the other I'm going to call the equity justice vision, okay? So I think those are somewhat descriptive, of, if a little bit clunky. Now let me start by pointing out something about both of these visions before I jump into them. Something they share. They share this. They're both salvation stories. They both acknowledge limits and problems and offer a way to overcome them that usher in a new pseudo or fully utopic human reality. It's important to see this because if we miss the aspirational promises of these visions, we miss an important part of their imaginative power. Why do they grab you? Because of what they promise. And these are yearnings we all have. It makes perfect sense. An effective evangelistic strategy that encounters another religion must at some level attempt to address the concerns and aspirations of that religion and show how they are better addressed by Christ. We need to tell a better story. So let's begin with the techno-naturalist vision. This vision is rooted in the physical sciences. It takes as a first principle that only knowledge gained through the empirical sciences is valid, and it proceeds to tell the story of the origin of the human race through the lens of evolutionary biology primarily, with physics at the early part. For a compelling and influential version of this story, I recommend Yuval Harari's Homo Sapiens. This is like one of the best versions of this story, one of the most compelling. The story in brief is that the human beings are the product of the random interaction of forces and particles that over millions of years come together to create this thing called a human being. The key moment in this story is the evolution of consciousness, of mind, and here the story gets a bit fuzzy. It's difficult, if not impossible, from purely material causes to explain the mind. Nonetheless, it follows from this human origin story that human beings have no inherent nature, 
that there's no universal moral code by which humans are to live, and that there is no transcendent goal for human beings. Thus, the goal of human beings is simply to stay alive and fulfill their desires without getting in the way of each other. So a good society in this view is one that allows human beings the maximum amount of freedom with a couple limits to do whatever they want. But there's more to the story. Because if taken to its logical conclusion, this materialist account also leaves open the possibility of human perfectibility. As one critical philosopher put it, quote, the human mind in this view is understood as an epiphenomenon of the brain's neurological processes. Human choices are predicted with statistical precision and unmasked as ultimately driven by the interests of the selfish gene. In short, humans are nothing more than highly advanced primates that will eventually be completely transparent to the analytical gaze of the natural sciences, end quote. In a purely materialistic worldview, human beings are ultimately perfectly understandable and therefore hackable, to use a modern phrase. And we can use this knowledge, at least the few who possess it, to change human behavior and make the world a better place, if not a perfect one. In addition, this knowledge, coupled with our technological advancement and applied to human biology, can also serve to liberate us from the very confines of our humanity. We can overcome death, finding ways to keep minds alive when bodies fail. We can enhance our abilities with technology to become more than human. This transhuman, Reinhold Hutter aptly summarized as this transhumanism as, quote, the angelism of the putatively disembodied sovereign subject that subjects to itself all of the external world, end quote. Now, granted, not every version of this myth is compelling. Some feel like kind of 70s science fiction reworked. But frankly, the, the whole arc of the story, that there's a way out of the human dilemma, and that way out is buoyed on great technological advancement. I mean, we're talking about chips and brains now in a serious way. This isn't just science fiction. You need to see the arc of the story to understand its potency. We can kind of understand this. It was, after all, the desire to take God's place that led the devil to rebellion. And it was the desire to be like God, which accounts for the fall of our first parents. The dream of being gods is a very old one, and given our inherent temptation to pride and the awe-inspiring technological advances of the day can be very attractive. And frankly, we also understand the good and healthy desire for eternal life, to be more than we currently are. So if the techno-naturalist view is expressed in scientific, reasonable language, as Yuval Harari has done, it can seem quite plausible. Over 12 million copies of his books have sold, and we know that by means of electronic media, the ideas themselves have disseminated tens of millions more. This is in part evidence of his talent to communicate ideas. He's a wonderful writer. But frankly, I think it points to something deeper, and it's this, that people already believed these things, or wanted to believe them. Truly original books are never popular at first. They take a while to be discovered. It's those accounts of reality that organize and powerfully express those assumptions and dogmas already widespread in the society that gain instant acclaim. In this case, the assumptions and dogmas that attach mythic hope to things like genetic engineering, the metaverse, the virtual global community of peace, chips in our brains, the colonization of other planets, and eternal life on Earth. As C.S. Lewis once observed, every age gets within certain limits the science it desires. The equity justice vision. The equity justice vision, this second view, does not start with science, but with ethics. Here the concern is justice, or better, injustice. It starts with the observation that some groups of people have oppressed other groups throughout history, as evidenced by historical events and present disparities of outcomes. It takes as a first principle that people are fundamentally defined by their group identities. Thus, the story of the human race is one in which immutable groups of people, one immutable group of people, is always seeking to dominate another such group. And in order to sustain this oppression, the dominant group develops systems and structures and language patterns that ensure their continued rule. This view is also inherently Manichaean. There are good people, the oppressed group, and bad people, the oppressors. And because identity is fixed, there is no way to go from being a bad person to a good person, or vice versa. You can become enlightened, you can come to see privilege, have your eyes opened and repent of it, but if you are among the privileged, you can't change your identity. And if you are among the oppressed, you too can become enlightened and give your life to social change, confident that you're always, by definition, on the side of the right. 
This vision, too, holds out a future promise. Through revolution, and this is meant quite literally, you have to get rid of the whole system, a new world can be born, one of perfect equity and justice. Now, I don't think I need to insist with you on how widespread these ideas are. They're in the very air we breathe. I think what we need to note is just that they start with real problems, injustice and in alienation, and with real desires. We want justice, and we want community. There's reasons for the outrage and longing. These are genuine results in, of a fallen world. Each of us has seen and experienced injustice, and each of us knows personal alienation. As Cardinal Ratzinger has written, quote, poverty, oppression, unjust domination of every kind, the suffering of the righteous and of the innocent are the signs of the times in every age. And each single person is suffering. No one can say about this world or about their own life Stay yet a while, you are so lovely, end quote. That's a line from Goethe, he's quoting Goethe right there at the end. So the unhappiness and the ethical outrage that drive this view of the world are real. And I think it's important that we engage at this level. Any effort to share the gospel with people who think this way must take the suffering of personal alienation and injustice seriously. This is what I meant earlier, by seeing the concerns and aspirations of these religions and offering a better account of how to deal with them. Let me just give you a line from Newman here that supports this. Quote, this is the secret of the influence by which the church draws to herself converts from such various and conflicting religions. They come not so much to lose what they have as to gain what they have not. And in order that by means of what they have, more may be given to them, end quote. It's not a matter of denying the longings for justice and full communion that drive this worldview. It's a matter of offering the only way to truly achieve them. We should also, in addition to this, observe the internal logic of this vision. If you take as first principles that group identity is fixed and that an unequal relations among group identities are the product of one group unjustly asserting power over another, then the arguments and eventual policies that find, our way in, that find their way into HR departments, for example, actually make sense. The conclusions follow from the premises. Again, back to first principles, because if we don't start there, we're not going to get to the root of the problem. And we're going to be talking about secondary logical outcomes as opposed to the start of the disagreement. One more comment on these two worldviews. There's something very new about them. That's by definition. We wouldn't have these worldviews if we didn't have this particular technology we have. We wouldn't have them if we didn't have certain kind of social developments we have. But there's also something about them that's not so new. As others have noted, the belief that we can, through a secret knowledge, overcome the limits of human nature, escape bodily existence, and that we can use this knowledge to create a perfect world are actually very old ideas. They're the core convictions of that perennial heresy called Gnosticism. Now, for those of you who've read history, sometimes the word Gnosticism can conjure up rather quirky ideas about ranks of spiritual beings, demi-urges, some kind of escapism, and strange ascetic practices. But at its most fundamental level, Gnosticism is a heresy that denies human bodily limitations, that believes that a special knowledge is capable of unlocking secret truths of all reality, and through the application of these secret truths, human perfection can be achieved. Again. We understand the aspiration. All right, so what do we do about this? So five things I want to recommend, five ways we might strategically address this. So let's get practical. Uh, I'm not going to give you something systematic. They're not in any particular order. Um, yeah, I just was lazy writing. The no, I don't know quite how to order them, right? But maybe they can provide some insight for us. All of these strategies are informed by a key uh, insight of John Henry Newman about the role of the imagination in leading to belief. And I know that there's um, arguments among Thomists and others about exactly how Newman uses imagination and that I, I understand those. But I think in sort of the broad sense of the way Newman discusses imagination, there's a truth here we can get our arms around and that at least on the tactical level of evangelization can be very helpful. So that's what I'm gonna use. Um, one insight into the imaginative a very powerful line comes from uh, an essay he wrote in 1841, uh, the opening of the Tamworth Reading Room, and he, re he used it again in the Grammar of Ascent. That's how good he thought it was. Here's what he wrote, quote, the heart is commonly reached not through the reason, but through the imagination, by means of direct impressions, by the testimony of facts and events, by history, by description. Persons influence us, 
voices melt us, looks subdue us, deeds inflame us. Many a man will live and die upon a dogma. No man will be a martyr for a conclusion. No one, I say, will die for his own calculations. He dies for realities, end quote. So the task of evangelization, as Newman saw it, was to take the truths of the faith and present them to people as concrete realities. He wanted to avoid reducing the faith to a set of pious abstractions or philosophical proposals about the meaning of life. Jesus is not an idea or simply a good philosopher. He is a living, concrete incarnation of God. God the Father is not simply an abstraction. He's a living, acting force in a particular history, in a particular people, and we can see his works. It is realities that convert our minds and hearts. Now, let me qualify this. It's important to note another distinction in Newman's thought to make sure we don't misunderstand him here. Forgive me for a little bit of technical stuff that I'll try to dumb down, and so I'll probably miss, but here I'm going to go for it. He distinguished what we should call notional and real knowledge. These are, he uses these words in very specific ways. At the risk of oversimplifying, the notional was that which we know through abstract reasoning, and real knowledge is that knowledge of particular and concrete things, and therefore it's largely experiential. The definition of a human being, a rational being, that's abstract knowledge. My friendship with Monsignor Shea and my knowledge of him, that's concrete knowledge. He noted that they're both essential for real knowledge, but that the university had a particular obligation to the notional, to the abstract, it's actually the task of the university. So first of all, he's not saying notional knowledge is bad. Another quick distinction, he's not saying religion is all emotion. If you've read any Newman, you know that, right? And I think we need to say that because I think a lot of evangelistic strategies, particularly for young people today, rely on emotion. This is not a healthy way forward. We need the intellectual conversion that you're pursuing here. Uh, he insisted, for example, that theology and philosophy be the center of a university. We might observe that the other disciplines, a lot of them depend on abstraction, economics, sociology. If they didn't make abstractions, we wouldn't have the theories and models that help us think. Nonetheless, he insisted that real knowledge also be a part of a university setting. So the question becomes, how do we put these together? How do we appeal to the imagination in a university setting, respecting both of these formal forms of knowledge and the particular task of a university? Five things, here we go. Number one, um, when we preach, to the extent we talk about the faith, we need to preach the person of Christ, the concrete reality of Christ. At the end of his grammar of ascent, Newman takes up the question of how the apostles were so successful. Quote, when Jesus was gone, his disciples took upon themselves to go forth to preach to all parts of the earth with the object of preaching him and collecting converts in his name. What were the topics of that preaching which was so effective? If we believe what is told us by the preachers and their converts, the answer is plain. They preached Christ. They called on men to believe, hope, and place their affections in that deliverer who had come and gone. And the moral instrument by which they persuaded them to do so was a description of the life, character, mission, and power of that deliverer, a promise of his invisible presence and protection here, and of the vision and fruition of him hereafter." End quote. The apostles did not preach a doctrine first, they preached a person, and so should we. We should speak about him in the concrete ways that we would about someone who we know and would tell others about. We should describe his character, his life, the things he did. We should speak as though we personally know him, because we do. We should talk about how our encounter with him has changed our lives, a change that we hope is evident in the way we actually live. Number two, second strategy, tell the story of salvation. In addition to preaching Christ as person, we also need to tell the story. As human beings, we are, as others have noted, inveterate, meaning-seeking beings, and because of this, we're myth-makers. We gain meaning for our lives by understanding the story we're in and the part we're playing in that story. The apostles did not just preach the person of Christ in a detached, abstract way. They told the story of which he was both author and main character. And this was a true history grounded in real events, located firmly in time, with a beginning and an end. It recounted the concrete action of God in the world, both revealing who we are and who God is. This, too, is a means for making the abstract real. And it speaks to the importance of salvation history in our teaching and the centrality of the word of God, even at Catholic institutions, for evangelization. Number three, strategy three, preach and foster the encounter with the mysteries of the faith in the unseen world. At the heart of faith is mystery. Now, not everything's a mystery. We don't get to get out of hard thinking by calling things a mystery. But at the heart of faith is mystery. And for the mysteries to become real for us, we need to encounter them. There are limits to reason. 
both in our power of imagination and human sense, but also concretely in the sacraments and prayer, we need to have this encounter. The same is true for the unseen world, angelic hosts, the Holy Spirit, for example. To not accept the reality of an unseen world is fatal to Christian belief. As to mysteries, Newman argued that foundational truths of the faith, the atonement, the incarnation, the trinity, to mention a few, run past the limitations of the finite reasoning mind. They're too big for us. Therefore, the proper response to mystery is not the application of our human reason at its most skeptical. Rather, the proper response at a certain point is awe, humble exploration, and of course, ultimately worship. The great mysteries of the faith were things one experienced, entered into, rather than simply scrutinized from afar. Let me draw this out from one of Newman's sermons on the Trinity. He begins the sermon with a brief description of the dogma and it proceeds to explain how we should encounter it and relate to it. Quote, the eternal three are worshiped by the Catholic Church as distinct yet one. The most high God being holy the Father and holy the Son and holy the Holy Ghost, yet the three persons being distinct from each other, not merely in name or by human abstraction, but in very truth. Now, should anyone be tempted to say that this is dark language and difficult speculation to set before a Christian people, I answer that Christianity gives exercise to the whole mind of man, to our highest and most subtle reason, as well as to our feelings, affections, imagination, and conscience. If we find it tries us and is too severe, whether for our reason or our imagination or our feelings, let us bow down in silent adoration and submit to it each of our faculties by turn, not complain of its sublimity or its range." End quote. For Newman, it was in the encounter with the mystery that we come to have some understanding of it, and more importantly, that we come to truly believe it. Newman employed a similar strategy when approaching unseen realities. He would use all his descriptive talents and all his dramatic sense of his imaginative potency to bring before the minds of his readers and hearers those things that we know to be real but cannot test empirically. God himself, the angels, the invisible world behind visible phenomena, the life of souls after death, the view of the world taken by the angelic hosts. He countered the reduced sight of the age by imaginatively appealing to a wider and richer and fuller world. Strategy four, incorporating real knowledge in the classroom. We've already considered the role of the notional and real knowledge in the university, but as we turn to teaching the classroom, let me reiterate that for Newman, this is a direct quote, quote, religion cannot maintain its ground at all without theology, end quote. But as a strategy for evangelization and in order to counter the false gospels of the day with the, these powerful imaginative visions, he insisted that the truth be presented in a way that appealed to the imagination as well. Perhaps we can sum up his argument with a simple analogy. For Newman, the educated Catholic needed both a map of reality, provided by theology and attended by philosophy and the other sciences, and experiential and concrete knowledge of the realities themselves. This gained through the imagination and encountering those realities in history and literature, for example, and other fields. To navigate a forest, one needs to know the smell of the earth and the feel of trees, and one needs a map to keep from getting lost or wandering off a cliff. And this raises an interesting consideration for a Catholic university. For historical reasons, the Catholic dimensions of many Catholic universities came to be associated largely with the number of theology courses in the curriculum and the sacramental life. In the current moment, however, a different approach is called for. If Newman is correct, theology as an academic discipline is not likely to believe, lead to belief in the gospel, simply because it is by design meant to deal with abstractions and not particular concrete realities. So how and where do we create opportunities for the gospel to reach people through the imagination in a serious college course? In what ways can the curriculum foster that belief, which Newman described as, quote, concerned with things concrete, not abstract, which variously excite the mind from their moral and imaginative properties, and has for its objects not only directly what is true, but inclusively what is beautiful, useful, admirable, heroic, objects which kindle devotion, rouse the passions, and attract the affections, end quote. I suspect there are appropriate ways for Newman's insight to be applied to theology classes, and I suspect you're doing it here, as well as other disciplines, and I've had the privilege to talk to you about that. But let me just take a slightly firmer ground as I throw some suggestions out there and talk about my own field history, because I know a little bit about it. And here I just simply want to point out that I think Christopher Dawson's proposal for what he called the study of Catholic culture has some things to model for us. 
For Dawson, the past was not to be understood as a series of random events, nor was it driven primarily by material factors. The history of culture was to be understood first from the standpoint of the cult that created and continued to sustain and guide it. This applied in every culture, but for the Christian, it's important as revealing the way in which faith in Jesus Christ found expression in cultural form. So Dawson proposed to study that process by which the invisible truths of the faith took on concrete expression and so became more real. To read the stories, the sermons, the literature that made the faith a reality in a given culture and to study the visual arts that did the same was to watch the imaginative power of the gospel at work. In culture, we see the invisible being made visible. We see the encounter with mystery made concrete. It was also in this way to see the power of the truth as it found its ways to renew human hearts in the testimonies and lives of the saints. To read about devotion to Mary, for example, was to see her as a concrete reality affecting lives, inspiring the love of millions, not as an idea, but as a person. Thus, history, while being faithful to its task of recounting and seeking to understand the past, is also a tool for reaching the imagination through concrete, specific examples of lived faith. And I think this is the kind of conversation we can have with other disciplines as well. This takes serious reflection, particularly in a modern university, which is premised on the isolation of the disciplines and the questionable conviction that there is some purely neutral space from which truth can be examined. The modern university and its assumptions is not built for this. Yet a Catholic university may, without losing any of its professional rigor, high standards, or openness to honest inquiry, ask how it can nonetheless make available without coercion the encounter with the truths of the faith as living realities. This is an important question that a community of Catholic scholars can only answer for themselves. And frankly, the willingness to ask these questions here is what makes me as a board member really proud of this place and happy to say I'm part of it. Last, fostering true friendship, last strategy, number five. Newman's emphasis on the need to examine, to examine and scrutinize first principles put a special emphasis on friendship. Why? Because it was his conviction that it was primarily in meaningful conversations with friends that one was best able to examine one's first principles. In a letter to William Froude from 1879, Newman agreed with his friend that, quote, men must have chronic familiarity to understand each other, and that truth slowly sinks into the mind, and that therefore paper argument is most disappointing, end quote. This was a convic conviction Newman shared with Aristotle, and it raises an important consideration for the modern Catholic University regarding the kind of community we create. It's important to look for ways to order the university to meaningful friendship among faculty members, among students, among faculty and students, among administrators. These friendships need to be characterized by real conversation. Hats off to Catholic studies for pursuing this. The kind of sustained and deep and trusted conversation that allows one to honestly recognize and then examines one first principles. This is something a classroom can't do. And I would posit that a lot of our students coming in haven't had these kinds of conversations and maybe don't have these kinds of friendships and come in with first principles uh, that oppose the very axioms of the faith. A deliberate effort to foster true friendship is essential to a Catholic university concerned with evangelization. I conclude. Reinhold Hutter summarized the modern ideological landscape as follows. Quote, the only significant struggle in late modern, technologically advanced, economically consumer capitalist, and politically liberal societies of the Western Hemisphere, here's the only goal, is to avoid at all costs being subjected to the sovereignty of others and simultaneously to maximize one's own possibilities of exercising subjective sovereignty, end quote. I think this is a revealing summary and gets to the essence of the modern Gnostic challenge, namely the sin of pride, the reign of the sovereign self. At the bottom, the errors of many of the modern ideological religions stem from a moral failure, not an intellectual one, the dream of becoming like a god. This suggests that the most important evangelistic strategy in the end is also a moral one, the fostering of humility. This is not an easy thing for a university for obvious reasons. The intellectual life provides an easy path to pride. This is why the religious who founded our universities made the pursuit of humility such a goal. And humility, like all the virtues, is something that we must practice. It finds expression not only in our words, false humility, humility is easy, but in the ways in which we accept adversity with patience, do not insist on our own way, bear up under humiliation, 
honor others and put their needs before our own, and most importantly, in how we worship. It is only in right relationship to God as his creatures, made in his image, established in our identity by him, freed from sin and death by his sacrifice, subject to his decrees, and dependent entirely on him for our existence at every moment, that we will come to bear effective witness to him as our real and loving father. Humility is the secret power of evangelization. So perhaps it's appropriate to end a talk on evangelization with a simple prayer of the monks who waged such an implacable war on the sin of pride. I'm sure you know it. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Thank you. So we want to say thank you to Dr. Reyes for that just brilliant lecture. It was really something to ponder over, and I hope we can get a copy of that to dis disseminate to our faculty, staff, and students. So thank you, Dr. Reyes. Thank you, everybody, for coming. This concludes our, our St. Hildegard lecture. God bless you, and have a good day. Bye.